Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, a warm welcome to those attending tonight and also to viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon, London. Tonight's meeting is of the Corporate Services, Commerce and Communities Policy Overview Committee. My name is Councillor Richard Mills and I'm the Chairman of this meeting. The key role of this committee is to monitor the performance of local public services within our remit and to hold in-depth reviews on topics of residents' interest. We engage with a wide range of external witnesses in our activity, which can include community groups, residents and subject matter experts. Where we identify areas for change or improvement, we make recommendations to the decision-making cabinet. Details of the business to be considered today is shown on the agenda, copies of which are available for everyone in the room and also accessible on YouTube underneath the broadcast. For those of us in the room, when you wish to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statements you make will be recorded and made available for the public. A reminder to all of us again, councillors, officers and our guests who will be speaking, that you should turn the microphone button on when speaking. This will ensure that you will be heard not only by those in the room, but also by those watching online. So going around the table this evening, let me introduce everybody present. On my right is Luke Taylor from Democratic Services, who will be minuting the meeting. First to my right, Councillor Wayne Bridges, Councillor Martin Goddard, Councillor Alan Deville, Councillor Nicola Brightman, and Councillor Farhad Chubadar. On my left, Councillor Jazz Dillon, Councillor Scott Farley, and Councillor Lindsay Bliss. Tonight we are joined by officers with Gemma McNamara, who is the Finance Manager in Transformation, and Andy Goodwin, who is one of our Financial Planning Accountants. We're also joined by Nigel Cram, the Partnerships and Business Engagement Manager, and James Roger, who is our Head of Planning, Transportation and Regeneration. Finally, I'm pleased to announce that we are joined tonight by Richard Upton and Becky Selby, who join us from U Plus I, who are our key witnesses for this evening. Um, before we just get started on the main agenda, a few housekeeping rules. No fire alarm is expected, so if it does go off, please follow Luke as our lead officer out of the building to the designated meeting point. Mobile devices... Everyone in the room, please ensure that these are switched off or at least on silent. Um, if you are using them to follow the agenda, try to maintain that that is the only use that they're there for. So with that all completed, we will now move to the main agenda. Agenda item one is apologies for absence. We've had no apologies. Thank you. Agenda item two is declarations of interest. Any declaration coming before us tonight? No, thank you. Agenda item three is minutes of our previous meeting held on the 18th of June. Those who are present, are they agreed? Thank you, they are agreed. Agenda item four, exclusions of press and public. So all items that come before us tonight are what we call part one items and are therefore held in public. Um, in terms of the agenda, to meet logistical arrangements, we're going to move it around slightly. We're going to take agenda item six, first of all, um, which is our review into our major review, which is local commerce, employment, skills, and job creation. As I mentioned, we're pleased to be joined by Richard and Becky from U plus I. Um, they're going to talk us through a presentation they've kindly put together um, and then there'll be further pieces around the, the bigger picture in Hillingdon that we're discussing as part of this review where Nigel and James may have something further and then we can open to questions. So with that, I'll, Richard, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, and delighted Becky and I are going to double hand a bit, but I think uh, Nigel suggested 10 or 15 minutes by way of uh, overview hour our history here in Hillingdon and why, how we found it and and what we've been doing over over at the old vinyl factory. And it's the first time I've ever been called a witness in a council office, so I'm not sure that it's a slightly uncomfortable <laughs> phrase, but the uh, but I'm humbled just by our full turnout here to, to listen to feedback and challenge. Um and, and Nigel gave me a bit of a brief and said just talk about the old vinyl factory but I can tell you how rare it is. Um we work in forty six different local authorities uh, throughout England and, and Ireland um, and I think it's the first time I've sort of come back and just talked about business challenges and various other things in an open forum. So is that rare in 30 years? So, um, so well done um, and, and thank you for asking me here. It's, it's a pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Um, I'm the Deputy CEO in charge of the development programme at, at UNI. UNI is a, a quoted company so we're listed on the stock exchange a um, a FTSE 350 company, so we have net we have assets of around 620 uh, million, and our overall development pipeline has now grown to around 11 billion. Um, predominantly, an hour and a half from our offices in Victoria, uh, Manchester, and, and Dublin. Um, and uh, our specialism, what gets me out of bed, 
is regeneration and the transformation that comes with it, with buildings, um, but it's the people that's, that's key. Um, we, we enjoy the challenge, actually, which is why I mentioned the word challenge, because most of the opportunities where we find value in business, they're always challenging positions. They're often surprising. They're very, very difficult. Um, and so we have quite a rare mix, sadly, I think, in the industry as a whole, of creative and entrepreneurial thinking, as well as the standard property development expertise, which we we take and we take as a given. We have a philosophy in you and I, which is a company that I co-founded, um, that uh, great places shouldn't be mutually exclusive from great profits. If one is to think about building a great company for the me medium to the long term, if you create great places, by definition, it's self-fulfilling. Your company gets better and better and better as your product, in in effect, gets better and better. So that's our starting point. It wouldn't be everybody's um, starting point. And the um, that was uh, there's a picture just on the the title slide of of how we found uh, the old vinyl factory, and then we got Converse to paint the powerhouse to add a bit of colour, because white's generally sort of quite clean and and happy, but it certainly wasn't when we we found um, Hayes. We knew, as did the council um, in 2011, when we 2010, when we first started to look in Hayes, and I'll explain the reasons why um, that this wasn't going to be wasn't going to be easy. That there are issues of deprivation that are local, and there are macro uh, reasons why it's potentially quite a valuable site in its connection to Heathrow and and elsewhere. But to create a great authentic place, it has to be inclusive and it has to think about its outreach. Um, and that's our start starting point as a as a sentence there. Um, there's around just over 60 projects that we have. Um, the largest is around 1.5 billion of value, and the smallest around 50 million. So we think at that sort of scale of intervention and change, um, and the vast majority of the best partnerships that we have are with with the public sector, and we have quite congruent values with um, with the long-term aims of probably public sector and sometimes maybe even more ambitious aims. Um, a very short example, here's a title page talking about our expertise. That was a library I built for the London Borough of Lambeth who didn't have any cash to build a library, wanted a self-financing library, i.e. at no cost, wanted a profit share, wanted a beautiful scheme, wanted a really green scheme, wanted a leisure centre at no cost and the list um, became longer. We added public art and various other things to that and successfully built that through the recession. So again, a really demanding council led by Jonah Greeny who's now heading up um, Croydon. She knew what she wanted. She was very demanding. She was very clear, very straightforward and some real similarities there um, at that time in Lambeth with what I've found personally um, in, in Hillingdon. The, um, there's a real opportunity I think to create very cleverly leveraged economic growth through partnership, particularly in mixed-use regeneration. Very often the tools left to a local authority, the strongest tools are planning and development control, and that be becomes quite restrictive and a battle at the edges, which is quite costly uh, for both an applicant and, uh, and the local authority. But where there's mixed-in use, there's a chance to really cook something quite special and, and locally distinctive. Um, and that's what we saw in uh, what was called London Gate, l the old vinyl factory now. Our preference is mixed use, but also in the donut of London, real places where um, relatively afford relative affordability exists in both the housing market um, and the commercial market, and therefore it's not some financial de derivative. There might be communities that will live and stay there. Um, that's being tested with the house price inflation that's happened over the last four or five years. Um, but that's that's where we want to be. Um, there's there's real value, and it's much maligned in public partnerships. I think the the special source is creating a real understanding of what um, a local authority wants to do with its town or its its city, and what great looks like, and working out how you can optimise and re repair what is damaged at the moment. Um, because that's going to, by definition, have the best financial and economic benefit. So fixing something that's broken rather than just adding another thing to something that's already, already there will have the largest effect. And so understanding sort of economic development and the, the real in-the-trenches issues that are faced 
in an area or ab about to be faced before one sort of gets a pen out and starts drawing a master plan is really key. So earlier engagement um, in regeneration and partnership, even you know if it's a private sector-led project, you almost demand, you know, as you're encouraging people to come and talk with you as a council, demand that from the property industry. Demand that as soon as something's bought, that there's a meeting within minutes and a, an agenda is discussed that I would employ you before it's baked a little too hard and there's a board meeting somewhere that expects something that might be unrealistic. Um, so I think we, we, do, we do it naturally um, because we're used to working in partnership with a, a public sector as a landowner but here at the, in Hayes we bought the land on, on the free market but had the same approach and I think that those early conversations are key to the eventual success of a project. I'm not suggesting that the old vinyl factory is perfect, by the way, because all I see is the imperfections of a project. What I'm saying is we did pretty well, <laughs> and we're doing pretty well, and there's lots of lessons to be learned. Um, there's always, you can always talk more and always have more conversations with both people through history and the neighbours um, and local businesses, and um, we, we try to be excellent at this. Um, we've got a long way to go to build trust as an industry. Of course, uh, the average is poor at best in terms of engagement. You know, one sort of long weekend in August, perhaps, or September, and a, a predetermined scheme for the most part is not an irregular experience. Um, we're getting better and better and better. The more conversations you have with the more diverse group of people, the better your scheme is going to be. Uh, that, that, that will be the acid test. You might get a scheme through, it might be profitable, but if it hasn't engaged and built and understands its local context, it will fail at some point in 20 years. Um, I, I don't want that on our legacy. We go to work because we want to create an enduring legacy with good regeneration projects. And um, the old vinyl factory here is the sort of triangle by the railway, and most of you will know it sort of quite well sitting off Blythe Road um, near to an emerging crossrail, we hope, um, and 18 acres on the market for sale and um, pretty sorry state I, I must say. The, um, I did the first site visit and walked along. Uh, Hillingdon is not a, um, a borough that I knew, I knew Bromley pretty well, I knew Bexley so I knew some other councillors that act in similar ways in, in a way but Ellingdon every place is very different I always feel very nervous of walking through and trying to understand a place unless I spend five years researching it but research the history look at the macroeconomics look at the deprivation issues look at the opportunity in that in that um, in that in those stages and here was a site that the council were very keen to get employment back because employment had gone out with the tide. So it was mostly about jobs and defending against, and I see this in your report, you know, the, the strong tide of residential developers just trying to build residential because it's more liquid and more valuable. Um, so doing an admirable job for about 12 or 15 years um, with people like Blackstone and others that owned the site, tried to turn it into a business park. I spent a lot of money on it. It failed as business parks change in their emphasis from Stockley Park and a sort of fountain into more urban and urbane environments to attract their key occupiers. This got left lost somewhere between the two, neither one thing or the other, a bit too carborne. There were 300 odd jobs with CETA at the back. Um, the second time we went there was a big yellow sign in Blythe Road saying murder. Not, I've seen that sign lots of times on most of our sites on the edge. So there's some various issues which obviously make it a bit more difficult to fund when you're getting that immediate history of, of, of issues on the site. Um, but inherently some lovely history, uh, delightful. And the more we looked into it, the more we could see that actually the biggest headline at a council level um, was to bring jobs back to stimulate the local economy and we'll accept some enabling development and some other things but you know it was really holding back uh, the keeping the opportunity for employment um, and the research that we did uh, looked for the oldest photo of going on a site visit looking doing a slightly over the top in my scarf but the walking through a derelict site it was pretty grim every agent said don't touch it with a barge pole 
uh, Crossrail will be del delayed. The, the commercial won't work. Um, tricky council, um, you know, from the outgoing vendor who tried to do whatever they needed to do. I don't, I don't know. Quite a successful company, obviously. Um, but bringing back life, bringing back jobs. Uh, there were 4,000 jobs on this sort of area as distinct from the wider factory, uh, his master's uh, voice. So there was a sort of sense, well, could you get somewhere near that back and some residential and some other stuff? Um, and um, we went to work and had quite a bold plan that we presented before we bought it. And um, it's quite an interesting story, really, because I, I remember meeting two councillors. I won't name the name names, but um, they were willing to meet um, before we bought a site. It's a significant project of some 200 million or so of value. Um, so willing to embrace and set down the council's agenda and our scheme probably more than doubled the density that was expected instead of 200 odd homes 600 odd homes and there were all sorts of other interesting things in there and our view was unless you make a great place that's locally distinctive you will just have some more offices that are unlet and that won't do anything for the local growth and distinction you really need to create invest in great public realm invest in a real diversity of use and allow great design to excuse a densification of sites as long as it's very carefully considered. And in fact, we went back to the 1930s, found a linen plan that had twice as many buildings as any master plan that was in your local plans. So we said it used to be busy, um, but it needs to be carefully designed to be busy. And so um, these were the buildings, some of which were sort of pretty much threatened, the powerhouse and, and the flat iron building by Wallace Gilbert and partners. Um, I admit I have a quiet secret. I'm a commissioner of Historic England. I very care for heritage, and I think it's sort of king in placemaking. And so we come from that bias. It takes a lot of money to create a wow um, from new, and so I don't knock it down. Um, just try and find a, a great use to inspire others with it. So the, the two councillors said, um, are you sure this is Hayes um, uh, to our informal presentation of the hope for the thing in a sort of slightly smiley way and we said back well look you know if your ambition needs to be huge for Hayes for it to have transformational change and we have that ambition and we'll take the risk and from there I would say that the the relationship went sort of slowly from strength to strength in terms of the people connection at the council and that's quite rare that you have people that are open to challenge open to a discussion um, and open to be convinced of another way through um, and then to sit collaboratively with your team and work through it. The inspiration is easy at uh, an old music pressing factory. Um, it's, uh, the archive is incredible and so to bring alive these things and to inspire great creatives with the history of a place. Um, maybe as important as the history um, is the confidence of a place which I think as a company focused on regeneration um, we it used to say on Hayes Station it used to say home of his master's voice which inevitably would inspire those people that feel proud about their area or the young children to go and you know get a, another job in something and that's now gone and so where is the inspiration and where is the hope and how do you drive it forward and I think any great project like that needs to have an inspiring device and ideally needs to uh, um, have the ambition of being world class because his master's voice was and, and some of the things that happened there was. So since then um, there's a master planning and a development process that's been incredibly complicated through difficult times. Um, Becky, do you want to just talk us through yeah. some of the buildings that have been built? Yeah, so if you fast forward from us getting planning consent in 2013 for an outline master plan to 2016-2017 when the building started to come forward. So the boiler house on the left-hand side of the screen is a residential building that opened last year, um, fully sold, so fully occupied with residents, and then the ground floor units are starting to be occupied as well with amenity space award-winning um, scheme by Studio Egro West, so they did an amazing job bringing that forward. Um, the shipping building, the, ne the next image along, was the office building that had the single tenant in when we first bought the site, so our first thing to do was reposition the site in a way that could attract 
more tenants specifically to that building as soon as we could while we were working up the master plan. So we put a cafe in, we put our own tenant, the CRL, which we'll move on to talking about, in on the ground floor. And um, that building's now fully let, so that's got um, just under a 1,000 people working in that in that building. And then the material store is another residential building on site um, that Fizzy Living um, brought forward with us, and there are... It's about half let now in terms of it's for rental, so um, a little bit of the delay has been from Crossrail in terms of people waiting for that to come in to want to rent in the area. Um, but it's a really successful scheme, and again with sort of ground floor uses um, that we're managing and we've taken back. The record store was the flat iron building that um, we showed earlier in an earlier image, and we worked with Alford Hall, Monaghan, and Morris to refurbish that that amazing building, bring that back. So that's our next office building that we're working on. There's two tenants in there so far, and we've got four floors still to let. So that's our next big push. Um, I think if we move on one more. Sorry. Okay. And some of the sort of ground floor uses have really started to um, to come in now. So we've got the nest um, here in the ground floor of the material store. They're a brand new startup company that um, offer bouldering and climbing facilities. Um, breakout workspace, a cafe, and they're opening next month. So their fit out's almost done. It's looking really good, um, and it's got a really nice synergy with some of the tenants on our site and the students at the academy. Um, and we've also got a new cafe that's up and running, and a food store that's moved in. So we we're trying to go for um, boutique operators, not your standard sort of brands, to try and keep um, startup supported as well as um, some interest in the ground floor uses. Thank you. Um, so there's a sort of summary, Some most of you won't know the site, but there's that same triangle. It's very dense, it's unashamedly dense, it's got an incredible amount of mix of uses. The, the dexterity needed to manage the change with different occupiers and car parking and Section 106 issues and wh whatever has been, you know, more than a full-time job for the Council um, ever since. But managed, I think, through relationships better. Uh, where you can have conversations and understand where each other are trying to get to, as long as you know there's a, a trust in the quality and the overall output of the project. I'll take you back to the, the 4,000 jobs, the 300 jobs that we inherited at the back of a derelict site that had been no more than 300 jobs for 12 years. Now 1,000 jobs in that, in that building, um, which is great. I don't think, actually, the, the, in the previous life it went through uh, boom, boom and bust. So we've worked through not an easy market condition. There's uh, 1,500 jobs on uh, site at the moment. The powerhouse takes us wor way through the 4,000 level. Uh, so those, those promises to the early two councillors for an informal chat to say, you know, should we buy this, should we take a risk? We have to, I have to make a risk decision, and I recommend it to my board. Uh, and I have to shelter that risk and try and manage it and take it forward. We're in the risk business. Um, so the, the cinema is coming on stream. I think there's a small cinema going in, and that will be ready early 2021, yep. uh, which is a nice bit of amenity. The food store is a distinct amenity. It's, it's not just an anywhere store. We've worked very hard to create um, the right mix of spaces and pub quality of public realm um, and the quality of architecture, which is key. But then um, I want to finish on the Central Research Laboratory, particularly for, for your interest here in driving economic growth. You can, as a planning authority, you can look at, you know, what's my strongest tool to defend space being you know, maintained for commercial occupation and enterprise. Um, but if you map it the other way, if you say, well, what is the most productive return of economic, socio-economic productivity per square foot? And are we using the wrong metrics, which we are? The property industry should have a clear metric for gross value added, and it should be a consistent metric for how much economic growth comes from that space. Um, and very often, it's not about the type of space, it's about the type of programming and the outreach that that space has, as you know. It's why universities and other colleges can be so powerful, but their true value is probably not well understood. Um, here, again, if you want to create something locally distinctive, I would buy a just go back into history, you know, almost like a farmer, see what was productive in the use of the soil, and all we're doing is we're just farming land. You'll find the nutrients in there somewhere. And sure enough, in this field on the outside of 
uh, near Heathrow uh, when this uh, the, the factory was built in the 1930s, 1932, I think. Some of you will know the story that the, the, the engineers, most all men in brown sort of coats making cabinets for music machines, were allowed to invent anything that they wanted as long as it had commercial advantage. They were given time, a bit of money, and off they went. And so they then invented the airborne radar. Um, they invented the commercial application of TV and the CAT scanner, which for a business not doing any of those things is world class for sure. So some of, most of you will know that that was the genesis. We thought, well, if that used to happen in the 1930s and it's created something that saved millions of lives and created something distinctive for the world in Hayes on this site, that's irrefutable. Let's rebirth it. Um, let's regenerate that idea. And so we have, uh, and with your good offices and Brunel and the RDF and a whole host of others driving a sort of startup business, uh, which is an incubator accelerator for hardware. Um, those are the stats that we've produced. It's taken an awful lot of hard work. But our intent is back to the promises to the first two councillors and to Nigel and to Douglas and to, to others. It, we've got to create an economic powerhouse from this grubby little site and uh, we need to make it special. Um, and then we need to make it stitch much better into the outlying issues in that community. And then our job must be pretty well done. And you'd speak well of us, and we'd go on to do it even better somewhere else. So we did that, the Central Research Laboratory. It's grown over three or four years into an umbrella company called Plus X that really allows these businesses to grow into flexible workspace so it's relatively affordable. There's a clear, clear purpose of socioeconomic growth. And from these things, they're a, a, a magnet of, um, of, of growth and opportunity and enterprise for towns and cities. So that must help us in our ambition when we're first talking about reinvigorating economic growth. There's a lot of differentiators. The slides don't show very well here. But great design is great. Uh, the quality of great architecture is, is key. The curated environment is key in a managed program of specialist facilities, so there's, I think you're going on a visit there, there's prototyping, there's 3D printers, there's all the mentoring, there's courses on VAT, on marketing, on pitch skills, and everything else, and it's gone on to support 48 new businesses since it's been built, so much so, even though we've sunk a lot of time and capital and energy, we've just rebirthed what was a brilliant world-class idea on site at Hayes, and um, only just Last week, Lovely. your planning committee, thank you, generally, um, approved the powerhouse, which seems quite appropriate, really. An old, it has the, the energy-efficient plant at the back. It has that sort of quite funky cafe at the back. And now powerhouse being powerhouse of innovation. Um, we'll have all of those mentoring programs in a purpose-built um, place, uh, well, in a, a reimagined place in the old power station there, Flunting onto Bright Blythe Road next to the academy. So, again, you can educate as a youngster, you can migrate, you can see people doing things. Um, and the output of this, when measured by Professor Eric um, Bishard and others who can do these things, um, is over 50 times the economic benefit of a, of a standard office um, over a five year period. And what we intend to do is to map each of that empirically so that we can show you the difference between the output of this to society compared to A and other space. So then perhaps when you're looking at the right content and the right mix of content to fix an opportunity again, then uh, you would maybe take a different mix of uses for something that's sustainable. Um, I think that's about it. I wanted to say the collection of you know, why Hillingdon? I don't know. An opportunity came up. Um, and all of the macroeconomic things, uh, elements and infrastructure improvements and everything else, your, your population, uh, speaks well of Hillingdon. Why wouldn't you invest here? You're, you've got a larger than average number of large businesses and your rate in growing small businesses seems to outperform most others in the area. And so that, that one's particularly important. That's where the future is. Um, the, the people that I've met have been um, open... Um, willing to discuss things, forward thinking, willing to have conversations when things are difficult. Um, you have that's not a regular thing. Um, very often, 
there's politics that can get involved so you don't actually get to some sort of risk assessment. I have to take a risk of, we bought this site for 16 or 17 million quid and it was more of a liability probably than it was a, an asset at the time and you have to take a view on your vision for the future and who might allow that to happen subject to the the proper process which there is you know, par excellence at, in Hillingdon. Mutual respect of an understanding of how you know we need to work and how the, how um, the probity and the governance that the council needs was really clear from day one. Um, would that be fair, Rebecca? She's had it the whole way through. You embrace quality. Uh, lots of talk about it. I would say you know, some of this architecture hasn't been normal. Silver things with red turrets and stuff. But you've embraced it, and your design teams and your officers have embraced it and have been brave, um, which is rare, but you need to be brave when you're generally pioneering to rebirth something. Um, and mostly, perhaps, just creating a sense of trust uh, where we've needed Nigel to talk about something to support something we need to do and vice versa. You know, we're one phone call away and it happens like that. And again, you want to invest. I want to invest at a personal level, which becomes a corporate level, in people where they invest in you and they understand in your business that we would want another four or five projects in Hillingdon. We just haven't found one. There's been a you know too too a bigger growth in in land values probably beyond what where where they should be maybe. Um, the in just in summary, there's a you know we're we're, we're in regeneration, which means bringing more life and economic growth to an area. But the the definition that I like of of regenerate has a wider definition that is um, that says it's sort of reformed or reborn, uh, particularly in a spiritual or a moral sense. I think we have a sort of wider sense um, in regeneration to do what's lasting good, um, and we'll be measured by that in 15 years post the old vinyl factory, and maybe I'll hobble back and we can have a chat. Richard, thank you very much. I think that was very interesting. Like I say, the, the old vinyl factory is a site that a number of members has as members and residents are very aware of or represent the area that it's based in. But I think what we learned tonight is also the detail that's gone in, into it around it and clearly like your, your passion and the company's involvement in terms of delivering it but also in terms of working on a, on a regeneration project in our borough. Um, so I'll open up to, to questions to you from, from members. Um, if you have questions around your experience or, or just even wider macroeconomic factors um, within, within the borough, just remind members way you try to operate is, is you have an initial question and then you can have a follow-up then we'll move on to another member to try and give everyone who wants to speak an opportunity so councillor Brightman. thank you chairman um richard how future-proofed is it in terms of the uh, climate ambitions for 2050 you know is there sort of a use of smart glass and solar power and ev hubs that kind of thing oh councillor it's, it's never enough um, and we, as this site was getting developed, there was a favour at a, a GLA level and beyond for a centralised CHP, um, and it's how you fuel the CHP and then distribute central heating plant, how you distribute that. That's tested now as to whether that is perhaps the most sustainable um, bit of future proofing <coughs> that a mixed use site like this could. Um, could offer. I think there's there's yes. a lot of conflicting views, um, and clearly, and there's there's an increasingly conflicting view between members the GLA and and some elements of that organisation and local authorities, and how that responds. And we need to get through both levels of approval. Um, it's not bad in that it has I think district heating in the round as long as the right controls are in place and the legal procedures are in place. Um, and there's enough scale in it can work perfectly well because you can just change the fuel supply uh, and you've got all the infrastructure in there so so in that degree and that was the original philosophy it makes an awful lot of sense to what will change once you know building insulation levels are, are as good as they are in, in modern construction although it's difficult in some refurbs to create a district wide facility with one central source that's managed by somebody who's got the economies of scale, uh, depending on how they bring the fuel to the site, is almost as good as it gets. But that's being questioned. You might know more, Becky. 
Yeah, I think the GLA has commissioned um, some experts to look into other ways of, of working with sites like this that aren't just necessarily put a district heating site wide network in, in place. So it's all being looked into at the moment. So I guess it's difficult to to forecast 35 years ahead, um, but we were following advice at the time and, and will continue to as it evolves, I guess, amend things so that we make sure we're doing what's being asked of us for each scheme. It's pretty good. The, um, I would. I would say it's often forgotten how a reuse of a building is using that embedded carbon. You know, when you knock down perfectly good buildings, we're using the the powerhouse there. I mean, you're not pushing those brick walls over. They are huge. In fact, the the floor slab is huge. Um, in development terms, I think it might be locally listed, but whatever, there'll be a real strength. It's it's not very efficient spatially. But taking it down and replacing it with a block of affordable flats or something else that might go through is an incredible waste of a, well, a heritage asset here, but just the, Im the embedded carbon in the, in the scheme. Um, it's, uh, it's very good. It could be better. We've done as best as we can, I think. The, I think the mix of people of different ages, ideally a school, an office, a cafe, and the sustainability in the widest sense of place might make one of the biggest contributions to you know, supporting the planet. And so if you can work, live, play, have opportunity, look after each other, and all those other things, as well as fuel and fuel efficiency, they might be more valuable. Councillor Brown, do you have a follow-up on that? Yeah. Councillor Bliss? I'm uh, not quite sure how to put this, but um, the jobs that have been and are going to be created, will they pay enough to be able to actually afford a property on the site? Because obviously property in Hayes has shot up in value recently, and the one thing that would make it really difficult is if the wages were low paid and people couldn't afford to live in Hayes. Well, the, um, there's a relatively affluent existing population in CETA, um, remember when we last managed them there, that population that was 300 or so, um, and we moved in a, a relatively mid-high ranking people, so um, what we've grown from that have been a similar work base. If, if anything, I worried more about the opportunity for local people to have employment on this site. I, remain, you know, I don't think we've been as effective in that as we could. Um, those opportunities to help those most in need locally will come from some of the support services in some of these buildings and, and staircase some training. Um, I've made it a particular requirement of uh, Plus X, the Central Research Laboratory. And whilst we've done pretty well, we haven't taken any difficult kids out of difficult schools and they haven't, you know, got a worldwide patent. Um, so what's our pathway and you know where is the, the door open the Brunel University liked it particularly because it was sort of something they supported but it was in the real world you know out in, in the world and therefore not a university building um, but we're still slightly too big a cohort of white middle class men inventors going through the process and so we have to look at that one of the benefits of sort of controlling it is you can say well maybe it could do more if it had that type of outreach program and that's entirely a uh, key part of the constitution of plus X and then it will become very very strong as the factory did that was there um, so there are quite highly paid relative to the local district jobs uh, incumbent we've only grown that on the ground floor of the two tenants on the record store. There's lots of links with Heathrow, so there's aviation companies, financial companies, there's a real mix, technology, scientific, so the offices are attracting investment from other areas as well as um, Hayes, as well as local local jobs, but I think in terms of residential there's a range as well of rental and, and to buy, so it's quite flexible in that way, so I think it would be great if local residents bought into it as well, but there will be people that might work in London and travel in on Crossrail and, and then want to live in Hayes as well as just working and living on the on the same site. So there's quite a range, I think, of options available. So did I not answer your question? You were saying the people that are renting residential there, are they working locally? Was that your no, part of the question? Can you use your microphone, please? 
Councillor Bliss, can you put your microphone on? Sorry, oh, just so it's picked up. <laughs> sorry, yeah, I mean, the point was, would people who are getting the jobs either that exist already or will be created, will they be able to afford to live in the properties that will be yeah. on the site? Well, they will, um, surprisingly here, because they're getting paid disproportionately higher wages, perhaps. But as a, as a wider rule, if you've got a house price at 12.6 times income, you know, across London, then we're we're all doomed. There has to be a correction to change that in some way. Otherwise, we're just doomed. It's just inaccessible. Councillor Goddard. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would imagine that in terms of potential regeneration projects um, around the country, there's no great shortage of, of opportunities. Um, uh, would I be correct in assuming that? Um, really to a great extent it's about the site and the potential in the site as opposed to the the borough and the way in which well, that operates? It's a really good question um, and you can get romanced by the site in itself but it has I have a particular interest in, in history because you you know it's provenance and it's something you can you can work with but no I think well increasingly um, sites that are involved in change, transformational change for an area, involve a big change for local people and, and that's not easy um, for anybody. They've had an edge condition, whether it's their election or a big yellow sign saying murder, it's how it's been. Um, and what happens in on a number of speculative proposals, as I'm sure you've seen throughout Hillingdon, is the blocks that are one through appeal that's slightly incongruous in their location have upset a lot of people and therefore you know, any new modern development with 35% affordable housing or 20 or whatever is going to be at that level of quality and there have been some great examples and some poor examples so sites like um, the old vinyl factory um, will have a, a greater need to drive productivity um, and that will need that will mean a substantial change because it's doing something that isn't there and that will be difficult to manage and therefore the council's role as visionary and enabler um, understanding the process it needs to go through but also encouraging stroke telling when they don't do it uh, the developers to really consult and get underneath the skin because most people know change is going to happen um, so the planning process is a stage gate of risk and risk management you're, you're going from a existing state and something that definitely doesn't work and costs a lot to something that might you know, where you need to take a, li a lot of risk and develop something through and that journey on a site like this can be you know five to ten years um, and so by definition I've, I've met another councillor Mills before in here you, you get sort of a handover uh, you, you look at the people around you there's, there's consistency in your officers and your and your, your members, uh, which again is increasingly rare, um, but the um, it's a really close second, if not sometimes a first, in competing interests. I know where I won't, won't be suggesting we invest, um, and it won't be anything to do with the quality of the site. We've just got to be able to have conversations, um, agree a, a, an agenda, um, and the, the scheme needs to stand on its own two feet. I mean, the, this is a great idea for economic growth in Hayes, but it still needed to be a good planning application, so it was really tested. Um, but there was a great deal of understanding given on both sides about what it meant and how it worked and trust. So um, I gave a talk to our team recently on relationships in business, and I would say um, develop them for the long term and create long lasting relationships for 20 or 30 years and that's where you'll create great projects that it will happen through that understanding um, and uh, it's very very difficult in some parts of highly politicized populist dare I say agenda in some institutions where, where you just wouldn't go irrespective of the site quality um, and from my experience at least and I've I'm, I'm a tourist in Hillingdon. I've been here for a while trying to make things happen in, in Hayes. Uh, we would, if there were a, a f opportunities coming to us in easy times or more difficult times, we would look at something in Hillingdon immediately. Um, and that's not to do with location. Councillor Goddard, further on the back of that? Yes, there is a supplementary, actually, if I may. Um, if you had 
had um, any messages for Hillingdon in terms of things that, that uh, perhaps we might do to encourage more of this sort of regeneration, um, what messages would you give us? Um, I think if you're, you're doing a pretty good job in encouraging regeneration generally relative to to many. It's the right type is more thoughtful and more harder work probably that will uh, the the council is the only by definition the maybe other than Heathrow the only he anchor tenant in the borough you're the only people that are not going to go anywhere forever and so once you start to think of yourself as almost John Lewis in the shopping centre and everybody else is going to go um, then you act slightly differently um, and the the socio-economic benefit of that compared to it being an office building is 50 times as much so there's net recurring rates, net recurring business growth, you know, as, as long as you can keep that going. In a way, there wants to be a bias towards those things that are the other anchor tenants of the future. And it won't be the balance sheet of a large business because they will go, typically, in the next 50 years. It will be your own distinction of why Hillingdon, what's the people of Hillingdon all about, what's our history, in a way, because no one can challenge that, what's world class. Um, and uh, perhaps, you know, I was disappointed not to have been able to buy the Nestle factory, look some nice design work and whatever else. Just think maybe there's another level of effort that can go into some of these things. You know, because the housing developers, of course, they just want to bang out housing units because it's twice as valuable, half as much hard work, and the government gives you a big tax incentive for no reason to increase profits. Um, not that that was a political statement about how, you know, right to buy uh, but here where you've got small businesses growing and becoming distinctive and creating world class things that change the world you know that's going to make Hillingdon a powerhouse of, of productivity in 50 years time how do you make that happen how do you get in early how are you brave with the right partners and build those relationships early and what are the key sites where that would happen best um, don't wait for me to come and talk to the two councillors who were willing. One was on a motorbike, I can't remember his name. He was quite an interesting chap. Came out of London. Uh, it was nice. They were engaging and interested and okay, prove it to us, will it work? I took a question myself. I know on the presentation where I went through, some of the sort of parts was due for completion 2022. I guess my question is just in terms of the people that from the residential side, where they're living on the site at the minute, how much are they impacted by the current building work? How, how do we ensure, that, how do you ensure that the quality of life for them is not impacted from living in part of a scheme that is this big and still ongoing? I'd say it's a lot of um, engagement. So we've got a lot of, we hold a lot of meetings, we've got a lot of um, updated sort of newsletters, both for the office and the residents, because it disrupts the office tenants as much as the, as the residents. But I think <coughs> as well, we've made it very clear that our vision was another few years off from when they've moved in so everyone moved in expecting it to become a great place and has sort of bought into that story so they're all really excited when something new starts on site rather than sort of grown in that there's going to be construction works going on um, so we've got a good relationship with the sort of managers of each of the residential buildings and we work with them that way okay thank you and in terms of if that's completion for the last part is around 2022 when do you expect to be a full occupancy of both the commercial and residential parts of it? Very soon after that, I'd say. Yeah, a lot of the residential is either sold during construction. Um, some of the rental might be a little bit behind that if they've got a market it and a few months behind that. But I'd say sort of mid-2023 would be our aim to have it fully fully occupied. Okay. Councillor Dillon. Thank you, Chairman. Um, forgive me, you may have already answered this question and I may have just missed it. Um, I think the scheme is brilliant. Uh, it's exciting and it'll do a lot for Hayes uh, it's good for regeneration as you say um, it has a certain bit of gentrification to it yeah. which uh, I don't know how the local residents would see it uh, and I don't know what you've done to sort of nullify that in some aspects um, but I also think they'll welcome it um, how how many how do you do you feel it will create jobs for local residents or kids at the moment within schools 
um, who really, you know, you, you talk to deprivation, um, and that exists at the, at the moment. Um, how will they aspire to work in those places? That's because at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about local com employment skills and job creation. Um, there are a lot of high tech companies going in, and you've got these aspirational flats, etc. I'm a little bit confused as to how that there will be involvement from the local community and those young people who want to actually aspire to work there, work in that field. What opportunities will they get? Do, or do you foresee them getting? Well, I think it's a really good point. I mean, they, uh, I worry about um, gentrification and just displacing some um, social issue, um, and we're we're aware of we're aware of that. I think I mentioned earlier. I think we could have done so much more in outreach of the central research laboratory because it's quite exciting and stuff. It's relatively inaccessible and it's hidden away. But to be fair, we were trying to make the whole model work and grants and, and, and building our own team. Um, so it's very much part of the constitution right there next to the college. So there's 800 students that go to a <coughs> music academy that's substantially funded by Global. Um, that's talking about music that was what this site was about so there's, that wasn't here before the old vinyl factory be called the old vinyl factory, it was called London Gate and it was going to be full of DHL and insurance companies and you know, whatever else so there's a music academy on site, that's good, that's quite uh, accessible um, and, and, and meets that local and regional demand they're going to walk past an innovation factory where people make hardware and create things that might change the world just as happened there before so there's there's a, uh, a tenant there um, the affordability of housing and how you balance that I worry about London from my end I you know came from a council flat um, you, there was an opportunity to staircase into three times your own income when you get there and you could just about afford a place and do that so there was always that hope you know, as soon as you take away an element of hope, you've got a disenfranchised society. And so here, there's there's the, the the college. You walk past this building that's going to have an outreach program. Our central research people talk and have involved the uh, the college kids in some things. So it's it's talking. Um, we keep the content and the operation of uh, of, of this facility, um, so we can program that. We can program and uh, require our construction teams to have um, opportunity in the construction process, which is obviously only transient, but still, you know, trades that we need to build back up and again quite accessible um, to vocational skills. So um, I think we've done pretty well on that. I know the last time I checked the stats, they were good, not yeah. brilliant, no, they're good. but good. Uh, so you can just push that agenda as much as you can. Does it feel a bit, you know, is the price of coffee accessible to everyone walking down there you know, on a certain income? No. But, you know, is it relevant to attract an office occupier that might bring jobs and whatever? Yes. Um, so we're aware of it and try and program it as best as we can. Yeah, I think so. Um, while we've been on the site as well, where can we've worked with a lot of local schools and we support homework clubs through the Treasury yeah, the Foundation. We're very quietly, um, but we'll tell you since you've asked us. We support uh, Captain Candia Chandran's Preset Charity, uh, now called the Chandran Foundation, that um, I have done personally, we have done corporately for five years, okay. eight years. Yes, um, so kids of a certain uh, group fall behind their education. We fund and support on-site happens every... Every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. There's a homework club that does extra homework and extra teaching for those that are uh, relevant to that group. And that happens in our office in there, and we've been doing it quietly for eight years. Yeah, which is in itself sticking plaster at something, but it's an element of bringing people in, um, and uh, very well attended, and very well reported back, and good outreach. Anything further, Councillor Dillon? Yeah, it's conjunction with not bringing Nigel in, really. Um, Nigel, for the future, how do you see? Um, these companies that will be going in, how we engage as a council with those companies in trying to attract apprenticeships, etc., uh, so that um, we can actually create a bit of positivity with our local residents and students, etc., going into these into these companies and maybe becoming better skilled. 
Thank you, Councillor. Uh, can I just, before I try and answer that one, reinforce what Richard and Becky were saying in terms of the construction training? On each of those phases, we have to have a separate construction training plan. And what we try and do is engage with the, the company that's going to build it out and make sure that that company provides um, training opportunities and local employment. So each of the, the, the phases has been seen local people working on them, getting skilled up, getting more experience, and therefore able to then go up that career ladder. One of the very exciting things about, about the, the CRL is the opportunity that it actually opens up, not just for starting to put haze back on the map, but actually creating real jobs. Because if you look, one of the exciting things that's happening in Hayes in terms of all the regeneration are some of the employment opportunities that are being created by James and his team in terms of the design and the development of the various sites. Now, a lot of them will have at their core mix, their mixed use. Now, what will that mixed use be? We foresee the mixed use coming from mainly the CRL. So you'll get companies that go in there starting. There were six people that started, or six small businesses that started two years ago. There's now, what, 40-something businesses, and there are 48 businesses. That expansion needs to be housed somewhere in Hayes. They will be looking to employ locally. They will be looking, hopefully, to stay around the CRL. If you look at what happened in Hoxton, it happened organically. Here, we're trying to help that. And I can only see that because we have a good working relationship, and they've got a good working relationship with the local schools, so you start to build those layers. The, the foundations are there to make this a real success, not just for the CRL, but for the people of Hayes, I think. Councillor Bliss. Yeah, I mean, we've touched on the support for younger people. Um, is there going to be any support for older people, particularly the 1950s women who find themselves unemployed with no jobs, six years to wait for a pension? Because they sort of seem to be neglected and forgotten about at the moment. I'm aware of 50-something um, men as well with a high preponderance to suicide and various other issues that are sort of playing out in stretch society in certain corners you get very very difficult stats on some of those nothing that we've done here councillor um, there's only so much one can do uh, our perfect regen scheme one day will have a school it will have a sheltered block it will have public realm it will have all, all walks of society within a very close proximity because that will it's called a village I think you know with a pub and a church and something else it's, we've been doing it quite well for a thousand odd years um, and you, you reinvent that and the disposition of those uses. Um, the, the, we've done nothing permanent here other than the spirit of the place when we invited Radio London to, uh, to do a broadcast all about the history of this site. And I went there, you were there, Becky, weren't yeah. you? And so Peter Blake came because he did the cover of Sergeant Pepper's thing and he sat in the corner with his stick. It's quite an impressive artist, so Peter. And he spoke with all the people and we must have got 60 or 70 former employees, former employees back, as many of whom were in those photographs with their blue rinse stuffing records in the thing. They, they look exactly the same, you know, sort of 30 or 40 years later. <coughs> That, that that sense of reconnecting with history and bringing them all back and talking about the factories was a great thing um, and, and quite revealing and quite important to them and their lives because this place, this village was, was theirs. Um, it's more disenfranchised now, it's more broken up, there's not just one social club and so those feelings of community are, need to be carefully considered again. Um, but specifically in terms of space, there's nothing obviously than the usual DDA things that encourages a more seasoned um, age of, of, of person in a particular position. Um, it wouldn't surprise me that there were a significant number of females in CETA over 50 working in that group because that's, those are the people that seem to pour out the door whenever I go there. But. I'll just bring James on that. I know he indicated around that point, if that's okay. Yeah, I was, I was just wanting to say a sort of general point that in terms of what you and I have done here, the amount of 
uh, benefit the council gains back in terms of community benefit with all the different uses and the economic development benefit is exponentially greater than the, pretty much all the other sites we've been involved with, myself and Nigel and the planning team in the past 10 years. So you've got thousands of jobs. So it, it, effectively there was a point in time when the council was worried about uh, the, the, the site becoming a housing site and you know what was going to happen to the jobs, but we've... Uh, the, the scheme now has more jobs than was ever, ever envisaged when it was discussions about it being remaining an all-employment site. So the the actual statistics involved with this site are quite sort of mind-boggling when one compares with what I, I might be dealing with on other sites where we're trying to get that sometimes it almost seems token bit of mixed use yeah. uh, uh, where the, the real jobs, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, and then there's, there's a compromise and the employment becomes a supermarket or something and you uh, and not that there's anything necessarily wrong with supermarket jobs but the, the num number of jobs one gets and the benefits as compared with this site so um, yes yeah, I, I, I know you said Richard that bits of it might not be perfect but the difference between this site and everything else we've been involved with in terms of mixed use in Hillingdon is it's just absolutely massive so it's I think it's really apt that we've got sort of you and I uh, sort of addressing the pot because of the employment benefits and other benefits are absolutely huge. I think, well, I know no, Nigel and I think. Yeah. Sorry, that's my piece. Councillor Bates, did you want to come back on anything just on that? Yeah, tell me just briefly because um, obviously you have training for young people, but a lot of women who are older don't necessarily have the skill to be able to take advantage of the employment that's going to be there. I mean, that was the, that was the only point whether there was yeah. going to be any support for them. I think it's a really interesting point, and I'll take it away because one of the benefits of you know, I often talk to my team, the developers and others involved in the environment get very excited about the cup, but it's not the cup that's important. Um, you know, the, the content, the content of that powerhouse. If it's about innovation, it's about making stuff. It's about engaging and the serendipity of all of those people meeting to create something that creates value for as many people for as long as possible um, is about the operation of that um, and I am particularly looking to encourage those that have got less advantage in their home life you know, to, to have some enterprise and hope because that's a bias and it's a very relevant one to look at those others I don't think we've looked uh, um, certain other demographics to see whether if there's a particular issue if you can add a little bit of benefit you add a lot of benefit so I'll, I'll look into it we'll come back to you okay thank you very much I think if in the absence of anyone else having any questions Richard Becky thank you very much I think to really reiterate James's point I think what, what we see from you is the real mixed use of the scheme like I say where a lot of the applications we get the large ones that there's no obligation, obviously, apart from your Section 106 contributions, you don't have to provide anything more than more than residential. So the fact that, that you do through the, the public amenity, the public realm, and the job creation side is obviously a real real benefit to the local area, which we obviously we as a local authority are are very pleased about. Um, so thank you very much for for coming tonight and uh, your presentation and for sharing all the, the information about the vinyl factory and for taking our questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, you, you're, you're free to leave. I know you need to, to get away tonight. Um, but in, I don't know if anyone has any further questions. I know that we have the report that, that Nigel's updated from the last meeting. I know there was a couple of questions around the startup businesses. That have, there's been some further clarity around those, as well as highlighting some of the details around the, the strengths and weaknesses and challenges that, that we have in Hillingdon. Um, so I don't know if members have any questions for Nigel or James further around the, what we're calling this, this bigger picture. Okay, well, I, I, I had a few, which I will uh, I will start with. So I, I guess I know Richard and Becky have talked a, a little bit around what appealed to them with the site. Obviously, the, the site was the main driver, but I think in terms of us as a local authority, what, what are the main industries that we have operating here? Um, I know you touched on it briefly in the report, and what, what do we do to make it attractive to people to come and set up their business here? I guess it's like a high-level question in terms of us as an authority to make it appealing to developers and businesses. Okay, well, you've, you've obviously heard from uh, Richard and Becky this evening in terms of what, what makes Hillingdon tick. I mean, one of, one of the biggest drivers, and I think I'll say so in, in my report, is obviously the proximity to Heathrow. 
as one of the it continues to be a big driver a lot of headquarters businesses like to be around here but there's also the spin-off in terms of, of, of what comes out from the from the airport so you won't be at all surprised to know that there are a lot of um, managerial jobs here and um, there are a lot of support services type roles and uh, obviously associated with the, the airport and the and the and the commerce that builds up to support the airport there's a very big growing um, logistics sector in our borough and I made a note to say to you this evening that um, we would have had colleagues from uh, Seagrow along this evening um, but they will be attending a, a future meeting they really want to come and talk to the, the committee to explain about their role, their investment in the borough and what makes Hillingdon attractive to them. So in terms of, if you want more detail in terms of the, how the job sector breaks down in, in Hillingdon, bring that to a future meeting so you can actually have a bit more in depth rather than me just giving you a real overview of that. Yeah, I think I think that would be like we we set these sections out. So I think the next one we've got skills and the future, and then the final one is the local picture. I think that that final one would be there, the most appropriate for that for that detail. Yeah, and in terms of investment, we're uh, attracting inward investment. I might use one of the future meetings just to talk to you about how we go about doing that and what we intend to try and do for the future. Because one of the challenges I've put down in terms of is that. Yeah, there are other boroughs, there are other destinations now that are popular in terms of particularly the office market. But then you get the spin-off from, as you've seen from Hayes, in terms of the other organisations looking to come in, like the organisation The Nest, that will bring in a whole range of new people to the area because it's, it's a new resource for that area. So that's what you get when you get the upfront investment. You get a lot of ancillary support investment coming in. And that's where we as a council might like to think about and you as a committee might like to think about how could we improve on that. So there are areas which I think we cover later in the view in terms of how do we support some of these challenges. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. Thank you Chairman. Nigel, um, there are loads and loads of entrepreneurs within our, our borough and I know particularly Hayes and uh, Arlington and probably West Drayton. Um you talked about loads of logistics companies moving in. We have a lot of development of big warehouse sites, but we have a dwindling stock of small warehousing sites and small office spaces. Um, could you look into you know, what plans we have for the future so that these smaller businesses actually have somewhere to go to? Because you know, small businesses trying to find a warehouse, for instance, we've got a dwindling stock, and all, we seem to have big warehouses lying empty everywhere. Um, um, I couldn't agree more in terms of that being one of the big challenges that faces um, us in Hillingdon. Some of the traditional old sites in terms of employment sites, because they are now so valuable in terms of residential development, they are being, um, the, the owners of those sites are basically selling up to residential developers and the existing businesses are having to go elsewhere. There is a ripple effect as they have to move further and further away to find accommodation they can afford. It is a big challenge in not just our borough, but probably Ealing and Hounslow as, uh, as well. Um, I don't have an answer, but I'm more than happy to um, give you some more details in terms of the challenge. And again, the, the conversion to, from employment to residential, the prior approval is causing us considerable challenge in terms of that small office sector. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Councillor. One, one comment, if I, uh, one point before I leave, there's a, a couple of things that spring to mind. Um, one, there's uh, some excellent leadership up at Birmingham, which would be going back to uh, my wife went to University at Birmingham. I didn't, never really wanted to go back to university, uh, back to Birmingham uh, for a, a project because I find it quite a miserable place, to be honest with you. But the uh, but so but you, you you go back you get invited back where he asked me to talk he was leading the regeneration there and again really forward thinking what are you 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 and I as a company that we want to work with we want to do mixed use we want to look at these things we can make things happen we want to displace all of those uh, those warehouses there and build an Olympic village but to do that we're going to 
do a sequential test on all of our green belt sites and we might as well internalize the value of you know a sequential test ourselves on a greenfield site and do exactly that build small industrial units next to staircase big ones and allow some of those displaced businesses to create a community because only the council could really be the steward of what you're talking about the free market goes for the highest value a bit too quickly and then it goes bust uh, and that doesn't allow for that economic planning so whilst there's a thin divide there between being a planning authority clearly and the, the property owner at a master planning level as long as it passed a sequential test to go and allow some of those sites to be developed and then encourage the new businesses into it to make sense for recurring revenue as well if you keep the development um, and then uh, there's a one briefly another example of where we uh, bought an electrical store and a bakery over in Newham Caxton Works again Studio Great West um, we built residential above three times as many jobs with lock up doors quite cool so that it feels you know, quite a gritty cool environment but there's Bookshire Baker Candlestick Maker there's, all, there's people making stuff on that ground floor and it's been designed so vans can get in and out and it's been designed so it's at half market rent for five years, guaranteed in 106. So again, you've got the residential effectively sort of subsidising these things. Quite an interesting model. Intensified the site, design-led, um, and the other one is the sort of strategic planning of internalising some of those smaller warehouse businesses because the free market won't do it for you. But, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everybody. I think in terms of the, the central central research laboratory that was mentioned, we have managed to arrange a visit to there, which I think we're going to take for our for our next meeting, the September meeting. Uh, we'll re come return to that when we get to the work program, but obviously that will be communicated to members in due course. So we now move back to agenda item five, um, which is the budget planning. James and Nigel, you're welcome to leave uh, whenever you wish. Um, but yes, so agenda item five, budget plan, Gemma and Andy, over to you to introduce this to us, which is the, the first look at the, the budget for uh, the next financial year. Okay, thank you, Chair. So, um, good evening. Setting, good evening. Good evening. so today I'm going to take you through the timelines for setting the 2020-21 budgets and beyond. I'm going to talk you through the report that you've got here in front of you today and just give you a, an update on the budget position for the count that the council is facing over the next few years. So in terms of the timeline, this is the um, we attend these POC meetings twice a year, so this is the first one in this budget cycle. So although we attend just two per year, the budget cycle runs throughout the entire year, with this being the first one where we lay out the context of the budget, um, pro, um, the budget that gap that we're looking at at the moment, and then following that, We'll then work up through the proposals with the final budget being set in February Council. So the report presented to you gives you the context upon which budget recommendations with specific proposals will be brought back to you in the second of our meetings with you, which will be in January 2020, which will be on the back of the December Cabinet Finance Report. So um, in the January meeting, we'll take you through the service proposals and at the end of that time, you'll be given the opportunity to provide feedback on those specific proposals, which we will then feed into the final stage of the budget setting process, which will then go to the February Council 2020. So um, looking then at the report that you've got in front of you today, the projections in here remain line, largely in line with the February 2019 position. So that is a budget gap of 28.4 million over the next three years. That's from 2020-21 up to 22-23. So the budget gap is um, largely consistent with what we've seen in previous years and is largely consistent with what other local authorities are facing as well at the moment. The, um, the gap in here is consistent with the February 19 position which includes an assumption of a council tax increase of 2.99% in each of the three years up to 22-23. So the £28.4 million budget gap after assuming that council tax increase is being driven by three main areas, that the largest of which is £12 million, which has been driven by demand-led pressures on existing services and inflationary uplifts. 
So those demand led services are mainly coming from increases in population within the borough. The other area being nine million from financing the council's capital investment program, with the last um, area being eight million, which is savings deferred from the previous year in line with the council's savings strategy that was agreed at the February 2019 council budget setting meeting. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. If there's any specific questions, happy to take those. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions on this at this stage? Uh, okay. I just wanted to ask, in you, know, you mentioned um, the demand-led increases due to rising population. Is that anything specific in terms of a certain age range that we're going to have to cater for more, or is it really from across all ages just to an, an increase that's across the board? It's really across the board. So we've got um, pressures from SEND Transport all the way through to children's social care, looked after children and children with disabilities, and then adult social care, which starts at the age of 18 going up to old age. Okay, thank you very much. So I think, like I said, this is really sort of the, the first look at what we're expecting to come um, towards the end of the financial year when the when the budget proposals will really get finalised and you'll be back before the committee in January with those detailed proposals mm -hmm. which will give us a further chance to, to comment on with, as they go to, to full Cabinet and full Council for the budget. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so now we move to Agenda Item 7 which is the forward plan. Run through this, so we have the Cabinet meeting coming up on this coming Thursday, which is probably a bit late for us to comment on. Just to mention to members, at this Thursday's Cabinet is this committee's review into the policing um, and community safety review that this committee carried out over the previous municipal year. And anyone have any comments on anything on the forward plan on this? Are we happy to note that? Councillor Dillon? Um, just, on just your microphone, if that's all right, please. Early on upcoming decisions, um, the cabinet meeting. Should we not declare these as uh, part two items that are on the report because uh, they are part two as the cabinet? This is the sorry. this is the public version of the forward plan that we put on. So we, yeah, I yeah, yeah I, I, I think because in here it's just sort of detailing what what yeah. the item is of something rather than giving because I think where a lot of those are procurement or contracts mm -hmm. where the details in the cabinet here I think it's just saying we're going to make a decision on who the provider is or something is that fair yeah. so if we were to have a conversation about it would that then have to be off uh, it depends what we went into but yes right, right. Okay. okay with that everyone happy to know that um, just as an aside on that we can always switch over the running order in future so if we were going to part two we could have this as the last item and that way, if anything came up, I could just break the feed and move on, if that makes things easier. Okay, so I, okay, yeah, so in that case, yeah, so then the, if people can just read it in advance and notify Luke in advance if there's anything that you want to specifically discuss, and then you can take guidance on whether we need to cut if it becomes a part two. Yeah. Uh, so then the agenda item eight, the work program, as I mentioned, the 19th of September meeting, we have managed to arrange for a visit to the Central Research Laboratory. Um, I think I, I took the decision alongside Luke that we were better to use one of our meeting dates rather than create an additional date, as most people would have this already in their diary, so it would increase the likelihood of people being able to attend, whereas if we chose an additional date, like it is, someone may already have an existing commitment that may make that a challenge for them. Um, so in terms of the work program, this will just effectively move everything back a meeting. So the other reports that we had scheduled for September which was the biennial safety review into sports ground and the annual complaints update that will move back to the October meeting and everything else will therefore shift along. Um, in terms of communicating the <coughs> visit details, Luke, is that something you will provide to members in good time? Yeah, Nigel has been arranging it and I think everything is confirmed with the CRL and I think um, Becky and Richard were involved as well. So I'll speak to Nigel and I'll make sure, obviously we've got a couple of months, but I'll try and get things out shortly after this meeting so there's a confirmation and everyone's got the details. Okay. Everyone happy to note that programme? Thank you much. And on that, that concludes tonight's meeting. Thank you for your contributions and attendance. Good night.